Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 63 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today we'll be saying goodbye to 2016, and what a great year it's been. I know for me personally, it's been filled with excitement, change, joy, and challenge. And I sincerely hope it's been a, a truly awesome year for you as well. To recap this year, I'm going to play... Uh, a handful of clips from interviews of episodes that I've done throughout the year and just kind of highlight the year. Then I'll kind of generally recap and then do the final Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. All right, so let's uh, play the clips now. Okay, and this first clip is from episode 55 with Mike Moses. And in the clip, he talks about doing security work with the world-famous cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Hey, I call my security jobs work. And, you know, of course, my hobbies <laughs> in play is uh, the martial arts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, you mentioned some of your adventures that you uh, you get to do with the Grammys and different uh, things and jets. Can you share one story that comes to mind with with your security work that's kind of put you in the glamorous place like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the coolest stories, and it, it really relates back to the uh, martial arts, is I got a call to take uh, this world-famous cello guy across Kazakhstan, Ubakistan, uh, all the stands, and he was doing what's called a Silk Road tour. His name's Yo-Yo Ma, and I was going to be his wow. uh, number one security guy. So I ended up spending two weeks with that guy take, carrying his uh, million dollar cello across all those places. Wow. And uh, it was unique because I tell the story, we, we were with a bunch of musicians and they were the top musicians in America. Most of these people had been to Juilliard, you know, they were all, all uh, violinists and just the top guys in, in their endeavor. You know what I mean? Some of them played for the Boston Symphony. I mean, I can't even tell you what kind of talent we had as far as musicians going across wow. the Silk Road. But um, I was Yo-Yo Ma's personal guy, so I had to hang with him the whole time. And after every concert, everybody would disappear, and they would go to the bar. Of course, Yo-Yo Ma would go to his room, and I'd have to follow him up there. And then Yo-Yo would spend another 45 minutes playing on his cello, but he would play these specific chords over and over and over, just kept playing these specific chords over and over and over to the point that it was so annoying listening, listening to it after two weeks. So I get back here and there's a, in my school, there was a music uh, teacher at a local high school that, that trained with me that knew I went with Yo-Yo Ma and he wanted to hear these incredible stories about Yo-Yo Ma because the guy was like, you know, to him, you know, just basically a superhero. So I started telling him the stories and, you know, I told him about the story about Yo-Yo would never go to the bar. He would go back up to his room and play his cello again. And the guy asked me, was he, was he practicing for the next day? I said, no, he kept playing these, these things over and over. He goes, well, hum it to me. 
So I hummed it to him. He goes, oh, stop. Like he had just basically heard a miracle. I said, what's wrong? He goes, you're not going to believe this. He goes, those are the basic chords that I teach somebody that's learning music from day one. I said, why would Yo-Yo Ma sit there for 30 to 45 minutes every night and play these basic chords? That's what I asked the musician. And he tells me that without these basic chords, the rest of the music's never going to sound as good. So Yo-Yo Ma, instead of going to the bar, the best cello guy in the world would go back to his room 30 to 45 minutes every night and practice the basics. And I, I was just blown away by that because I was like, man, that's the same as that thing in yeah. the martial arts. Man, it gives me you know chills hearing that. Yeah. That's so incredible. I was like, I was like, man, this is, this was so neat to me how, you know, and this was a week after I got back, but uh, just to see the best guy in the world and he still focuses on the basics. And you wow. think about martial arts, man, that's the same exact thing that everything boils back down to, you know? So Absolutely. anyways. What a great story, man. Thanks for sharing that. Like I said, it gave me chills because that's just ah, the magnitude of that. He could be doing all these other things. And what does he do? goes back to uh, the foundation, the basics and spending the time there. It's amazing. It's great. Yeah, I was, I was so thrilled with that. But yeah, other than that, you know, just... I hate talking about the security stuff because it sounds like I'm bragging. You know what I mean? For so sure, sure. I just, I just really uh, just say I've been blessed in a sense that I never thought I'd be doing what, I, what I'm doing today in every respect. You know what I mean? So anyway. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing the one, and we'll, we'll move on from there. But it uh, sounds like you've had a really great time at it and been able to do some incredible things and some, some incredible uh, adventures. Okay, in the next clip, it's from episode 57, my interview with Master Pedro Sauer, and always a pleasure to speak with Master Sauer. In this clip, Master Sauer talks about preserving jiu-jitsu, Carlos and Elio Gracie's jiu-jitsu, and the evolution of self-defense jiu-jitsu to the competition aspects of jiu-jitsu. My idea was always been, man, we need to preserve the art of jiu-jitsu. Because jiu-jitsu today, as a sport and as a self-defense, those two branches that went out, it is a, it is almost like a misguide. You misguide the public, because jiu-jitsu, the, the real jiu-jitsu that was developed in Brazil, by the, you know, Carlos Gracie learning from uh, Conde Coleman, Carlos Gracie passing to Elio Gracie, and Elio Gracie adding his flavor. Those guys did under a very harsh environment. They did those those moves, those techniques was being developed to work in a street, no hose bar, street application. When I talk about no hose bar, I'm talking about eye gouging, biting, and all kind of the the dirty, growing, every kind of growing. I'm that's how it was back in the early days, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s, close to 1960s. Great Marcelo Gracie with the popularity of jiu-jitsu growing, he decided to create a sport. They, they decided to create a little branch where people can actually put two practitioners to compete against each other to see who had a better jiu-jitsu. But at that time, everybody knew self-defense. Everybody was involved in self-defense because in Rio de Janeiro, if you are going to be in a fight against somebody, you cannot imagine that you're going to just sit down on the ground and the guy's going to get in your guard or you're going to you know, surround himself with butt scooting. Every fight starts standing up. Right. And that's how they done it. That's how Elio Gracie done it. That's how most of the fights, if you see Carson Gracie, you, you see Halls, Hickson, uh, Helson, you know, all those guys, even though the, the jiu-jitsu practitioners is not 100% involved in judo, beautiful judo takedowns, incredible takedowns in judo, but it's a very important part of jiu-jitsu to have the knowledge to put somebody down on the ground, safe. So that's the way how jiu-jitsu was developed. And uh, later, what happened that in 1990, when we came to America, it was a gap. It was a gap that happened in Brazil. From 1990 to 96, it was this gap where a lot more people started being introduced to jiu-jitsu, but only through competitions. Mm. And the IBJJF uh, started 
uh, around the time, 95, 96. And a lot of people started getting involved in jiu-jitsu, but more for competition style. And what happened is a lot of instructors that stay in Brazil, they were not instructors that was, um, I won't say like a qualified, but I want to say they, wanna make, they wanted the students to go and represent the school. If you go there to compete and represent my school and you bring a medal, I can get more students. Doesn't matter how you done it, matter that your arms was, was up on the, on the air. Mm. So the rules that people start surrounding, human beings, we always find a gap. Right. I, can, I don't care which country, who you are, if you give the possibility of sport, you will find a gap, how to score the points, mm-hmm. how to maintain those points. So I saw this happen in Brazil. So you see the fights now, they, they, they get together, they kind of clump to each other with nobody scoring points whatsoever. They both guys sit on the butts, they wrap each other's legs, and they stay there. If the match is 10 minutes, they spend eight and a half minutes on the same position, pretending they're doing something. Right. When come a minute left, they put everything they got to score the, the advantage or to score the point or to do some kind of maneuver that's going to give them the extra the advantage. And after that, they just lay on top and don't do nothing. You know, and the sad part is that that guy is going to end up winning the match. And because the IBJJF, the way how it goes is that if you compete one year and you're a blue belt and you got the gold medal, then you compete another year, blue belt, gold medal. You, you come in the third time, say, hey, you cannot be in a blue belt anymore. You know, you have to pass it on. Right. So a lot of people in Brazil got, got promoted specifically by winning tournaments, by advantage, mm. by two points, with using strategy. And when they got the, the, up to black belt, okay, now I'm black belt, I'm going to open my school. Well, what are they going to be teaching? You know, strategy of tournaments. Right. So that's what happened today all over the world. And uh, this started in Brazil. That's what happened in Brazil in the, in the 90s. But now it's spreading everywhere. In my personal opinion, I would like to see everybody. Imagine you have somebody as a, a brand new guy coming to class and learn a curriculum. You just learn curriculum. You got to learn punch block. You got to learn distance management. You got to learn punch uh, kick block. Mm-hmm. You got to learn head block. You got to learn our self-defense. And after that, you can compete as much as you want. No problem. You can grab as much as you want. No problem. But your basics, now that you have in your brain as a basics, is no longer sport, but it's self-defense. Mm. That means you're going to be able to pass a self-defense better to, to other people. Yes. I believe that everybody that is there teaching class, teaching, you know, put a black belt, and you are teaching uh, in front of 20, 30, 50 people, if you do have self-defense in your, in your arsenal, you're going to provide a better service. Mm. Yeah, that's my personal you know, opinion. I like the way you said that, because a lot of people think this is kind of a new concept. But the way you described it is way back is how Helio had it. Everybody, when they start, when the competition stuff came aboard, it was because everybody else already had the foundation. So it wasn't skipping any of that. It was just building on it to another realm of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Okay, in this next clip, it's from episode 53, interview with Little Tony Pazinski. And Little Tony talks about the Jiu-Jitsu Global Federation, how it was formed and developed. Well, whatever there could be a federation of jiu-jitsu that was sport, education, and community, like where we could all come together. I'd come to the table and talk about jiu-jitsu, and I know I was just like, there's so many people that do jiu-jitsu that will never compete, or they're finished competing. They just they want they're practitioners, and instructors right. need to be you know better instructors. And I was just like, I'm gonna start. So I started every night coming home from jiu-jitsu and working and just kind of grinding it out. Started filing trademarks the world Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Federation, you know, things like that. And you have to wait, you have to wait like months for that stuff to get approved. And then you get the telephone call if it's approved or not from the, uh, the trademark office in the United States. And, you know, it gave me time to put things together, have a lot of writing. And uh, I started to put my little team together, like people that I wanted to, you know, be a part of this. And I, I contacted uh, a black belt named George Pereira, who is like a legendary Valley Tudo fighter. And he's like, oh, you know, this is a good idea, Tony, but I, I want to get my, my blessing from my master, Hickson. And I, he goes, I think Hickson wants to do a federation. And I was like, wow, 
that's <laughs> that's uh, that's some good information for me to know right now. Maybe one day <laughs> I'll reach out to him, see how it goes. And I had met Hickson like maybe once or twice at a, a jiu-jitsu tournament or at a seminar. You know, he he took a seminar. I took a seminar and and I was amazed with his invisible jiu-jitsu and everything like that. But I was never able to. I always trained with his other brothers and things like that. So after Metamorphs too with uh, with Crone, he he was in the main event there. I knew Hickson was in town and I was living in Redondo Beach and I just kind of put something out on Facebook. I was like, I want to meet Hickson. And one of my instructors named uh, Julio Foco Fernandez gave me Hickson's email and I messaged Hickson. I said, you know, I have an amazing idea. I've been working really hard at it and uh, it's about Jiu-Jitsu Federation and I would prefer to look you in the eyes to tell you. And I figured that was pretty samurai to say something like that to Hickson. Right. So. <laughs> He nice. messaged me back. Uh, he said, okay, um, I'll give you five minutes, you know, because I asked for five minutes of his time. And he's like, you know, meet me in Santa Monica on a Tuesday. So I was so nervous. And uh, I met I met Hickson on a Tuesday, and I said, how much time do I have? And he said, you got five minutes. And it was like, oh, my God. So <laughs> you know, one thing led to another. That five minutes led to over an hour. We were talking about jiu-jitsu, all things, very passionately. And uh, he said, you know, I want you to – meet my, my partner, my friend, and you guys can Skype. And I, I stopped right at the door when we were walking back in. And I said, uh, I said, Hickson, we, I can always Skype with your partner. I want to meet him. And he was like, he like, Tony, I can feel your, I can feel your heart. And he's like, meet us in Brazil in August. Wow. I was like, he's like, all right. So he had uh, 24 hours to think about that conversation, that meeting. And at that meeting, I also said, listen, I, I, I knew that you wanted to do a federation. I had talked to George Paris. Like I, I, I exposed all my truths, all my cards, yeah. and he had, he had time to think about it. So the next day, I remember being like really tired because I was so exhausted from everything that I was writing and doing and multitasking. And I had that feeling with, like your eyes are open, but they're still closed behind. They're really dry. And Hickson sent me this really brief e- email, and he was like, I can tell that your intentions are – you know, from the good and we have a, we have the same mission. So let's get started. So I was like, I read that email, like on my phone, I was looking up at the mirror and it was like, my eyes were tearing, you know, like, like I was so, so excited because I was like, you know, me, me trying to get involved in like a jujitsu on a bigger scale. I feel I pretty wouldn't get a lot of attention. I mean, I would try my best. I mean, I would always, but I said, if Hickson says something, he's going to, you know, this has, a, this has a chance now. And, um, that was the start. So then I went down to Brazil and I met Carlos Gama and we had a, a great conversations in there and we it led back to, uh, some more meetings in LA and, you know, about a year before the, the what would become the Jiu Jitsu Global Federation. I, I was working with Carlos and, and with Hickson and then for like a, like almost a year in the back, like going to, Santa Monica and having conversations with Hickson about jujitsu and doing work for like every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm like, this is the cool, this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. Like I always wanted to meet this guy. I always wanted to train with Hickson. I always, you know, I never had a chance. And now I'm like hanging out on Thursdays with the sun coming in the wind. And we're just wow. talking about all things jujitsu. Like for me, I had figured I hit the jackpot and yeah, I wasn't even training with him. Yet. I was just like, you can't, I remember si- I remember being in like uh, the supermarket with a can of soup. And I was had it in my hand. I was like, going to put it in the bag. And I'm like, I don't even know who to express this to. Like, who could understand <laughs> what is going to happen now? Yeah. Like, I mean, just as a just as a as a practitioner, as a student, I have like I I have access to one of the the greatest jujitsu guys of all time. And he he, it's the kind of jujitsu, the the invisible jujitsu, and all this other stuff that's for real. And you know, all that stuff would eventually come to pass. And it was. You know, when the Jiu-Jitsu Global Federation launched, I was working so hard and doing so much. But you know, it's all it doesn't matter when you have like you know passion for something like this. So wow, it that's was, amazing, uh, man. Yeah. Okay, next clip features Roy Dean, and that was from episode forty-five. And really enjoyed this interview. Uh, Roy had talked about his new book. He talks about ego and training as well as yoga and why it complements jiu-jitsu so well. And in this clip, he discusses the subject of letting go. 
Now, here's the truth. You will lose every student that comes to you, eventually, over time. How gracefully can you let go of things? You have to learn to celebrate the release, but it's easier said than done. And I know you were speaking specifically as an instructor, but, yeah, share a little bit more insight on on that and and just the whole letting go process. Mm, Yeah, that was exactly the opposite of how I thought when I first started teaching. Originally, when I started teaching, I, you know, I did a little experiment. I was in San Diego. I asked Mr. Harris's permission to lead a grappling class at this uh, big Aikido school in San Diego. And I did. He granted me permission. I started it on the weekends. It, it started attracting people. And I wasn't even really trying. It just started attracting people from various schools. So I, I definitely said, oh, well, that's good. That's working. And I thought that that same mojo that I had would keep students with me for forever because I was was a good teacher. You know, I actually had real skill. Um, I just had my own presentation where uh, the art where I thought people actually progressed a little bit faster um, than many of the other, um, you know, instructional modalities that I had experienced. So I thought, yeah, everyone will stick with you. Uh, but that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Some people will stick with you. Well, hell and high water, they'll stick with you. You're their teacher. Um, you know, people are going through their own thing and everyone has a struggle or that they're they're dealing with. And very often it's about them. It's not about you. So I used to take things just far too personally because I was, very personally invested in teaching the art. Um, and being able to let go of people is something that I wish I knew right away. Of course, you let people go in a professional manner. Um, if it's a student, it's a handshake and a conversation, you know, and you wish them well, wherever they end up, you wish them well. Um, and often, look, if, if they want to go, they're, they're, already, they're already gone. Don't, don't try to hold on to people. Um, you may think, oh, I'm, I'll be losing money. Don't worry about that. The, the money is in the new students that are walking in the door. It's not in the people that are there right now. You know, but don't try to hold on to people. You need to let people go gracefully. And you know what? They may realize, seeing another teacher, that, oh, actually, his approach was, I think, a lot better. They may not admit mm-hmm. that, but... Later, they might. They might say, you know, I thought I wanted like a really competition heavy oriented school, but I've never been so injured in my life. But it felt good for those couple times that I did it. And, or they may, uh, or you might realize that, you know, the vibe is a little bit better w- without that, that person here. And yet I was struggling to hold on to them. And so basically, everybody that comes in your door. You just want to have a professional rapport with them and guide them as long as they want to stay on the path. And when it's time for them to go, you need to just say, hey, I appreciated your company and I wish you the best. People have a hard time doing that in a professional context. Mm -hmm. And, And as time went on, I got much better at it, much better. And I think that, uh, I think that, you know, and occasionally I will read a social media post about loyalty or this person or somebody's yammering or somebody's, you know, number one, I think that's oversharing. And number two, just accept it now. Accept it right now. And so when it comes, it'll be so much easier. It's coming anyway. Just get used to it. It's true. I think it's uh, professionally and personally, it's hard for a lot of people to come to grips with with letting go. But I think this is really important, and I'm glad you put that 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 part in your book because I think, especially as instructors, anybody who's been in that position, uh, I think it's really hard to not take it personal when someone doesn't keep coming. But like you said, there's so many different reasons that someone may end up their journey may start taking them somewhere else, and that may be to another. A jiu-jitsu school or may just be off the jiu-jitsu path or whatever. But Absolutely. Uh, getting to the point of saying it's not about me as an instructor, it's it's about their journey. 
And I mean, I'm glad to have been able to be a part of that. But it's not, you know, don't take it as an insult or a failure or whatever it may be. It's it's their journey. Mm. Yes. Well said. Okay, this next clip is from episode 44, interview with Chris Saunders, Hicks and Gracie's first American black belt. And in the clip, he talks about the early days of training, being part of the original Dirty Dozen, and learning from Master Hickson. I mean, not to say that I'm that great, because I'm nobody special. I was just right place, right time, started before everybody else. And, you know, the thing hadn't developed like it was now. But at that time, I was pretty much like the best guy, as far as I know. There was like, you know. Wow, that's great, man. Yeah. And what did that feel like? To be in that position like that. Well, yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, I from the beginning, I, I loved it. I mean, I, I idolized Orion, and uh, you know, it was like, I mean, like going back to the garage days. You you do like a half hour private, and I remember he'd invite you up to have dinner sometimes, and you'd have like corn soup and carrot juice, and he'd get out the old newspaper clippings of his father challenging Joe Lewis and. <laughs> and, and show you these old VHS tapes of, um, I think they called it NHB, you know, holds barred or, or no, they called it Valley Tudo. And this mm. was like the predecessor to MM, MMA, you know, guys right. wearing speedos and a boxing ring and no time limit, no weight class, you know, no, wow. everything goes groin shots, whatever. And, you know, showing uh, Hickson fighting Zulu yeah. and, I was just like, oh, my God, that's like a cockfight. You know, it was really in, intense. And right. uh, so that was – so it was like you had a, a secret weapon, you know, because even wrestlers who are so formidable nowadays, they weren't that big a deal because you would triangle them, you'd armbar them, you'd slide around to their back. And, uh, you know, so I, in some, some respects I miss those days where – it's like you could not get in a fight with anybody that knew jujitsu because you knew everybody who trained. <laughs> right. You know, you knew the 10 other guys or 20 other guys. Well, Richard Bresler uh, speaks a little bit about that too, that whole felt, how it felt like a secret weapon, you know? Yeah. Um, because the people you, you're training with knew it, but other people that you would encounter. You exactly. Know, they, just, they didn't know. It wasn't widespread by any means. Yeah. So what a cool time to be uh, to be involved in it. Um, you're in a group called, or known as the Dirty Dozen, which uh, refers to the first 12 Americans that were uh, got a black belt from a Gracie family member. So what's it like to be part of that group? And in talking about Max or Hickson, what's one of the most important things you learned from him that sticks with you? Yeah, well, as far as the Dirty Dozen, that's that's an interesting story. About three years ago, I was training at the Torrance Gracie Academy, and one of the brown belts, I think it was Ryan Parker, he was talking, I heard him mention something about the Dirty Dozen, and I'm like, what's that? The top uh, most pesticide-filled fruits and vegetables? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it sounds like. Huh? Yeah, and I didn't even know what it was. And he's like, no, it's the top 12 black belts, and you're one of them. I, oh, really? Cool. I didn't even know. So, wow. As far as that goes, I knew I, obviously I knew I was the first American to get a black belt from Hickson, but I didn't know I was dirty dozen. Um, yeah, as far as um, Hickson, uh, what was the question? What's the most important thing? Well, yeah, what was the most important? One of the most important things that stands out to your mind that you you learned from your time with him? Yeah, I, I mean, so many things and so many different phases. I guess I could start with when I was in Brazil, you know, doing all the privates with him, and uh, he was passing my guard and he would sort of, you know, adjust his level to your level. And, and I was kind of, uh, I think they called it repose or, um, in, in at Torrent or the Gracie university, we call it like block and shoot. Basically if someone's kind of double underhook, passing your guard, stacking you and you kind of block their hip and shoulder and hip out and recover guard or go to high right. low guard, that, that kind of thing. So I was doing that, kind of getting balled up and kept kind of recovering and recovering. And I thought, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. And then he said, you don't move your hips. You don't move your hips at all. So we did four privates with my hands in my belt, just using my legs. And, oh, man. Yeah. And he talked about, you know, your legs should be for defense and then your arms are free to attack. Mm. And... 
my my game, especially my guard, it just exploded after that. I mean, I remember none of the other blue belts could pass my guard immediately after those four classes. So that's one of the things I'll always do with students at some point or another is have them put their hands in their belt. And, of course, you got to do it with somebody ideally initially below your level and then maybe at your level and then, you know, work up because someone better than you is going to pass your guard pretty quick. Right. Um, so that, I guess that was one thing, um, you know, he's a, he's an innovator. He always never accepts a technique or he does for a while, but then he'll constantly improve things and modify things. You know, probably you hear about all the principles, you know, as opposed to just teaching you this technique, that technique, another technique yes. or uber detail, you know, hold the fingers like this, the wrist like that, the elbow here. It's more like the way you keep your weight, the, the balance, the posture, the connection, making the, the opponent feel uncomfortable. I was thinking about this also when, uh, I don't even remember this so much when I was in Brazil, but when Hickson moved here, maybe around 89, and he was teaching at the Torrance Academy, and we would do groups, and it started becoming more like Brazil, and we would do these warm-ups, and he would incorporate all these jiu-jitsu movements into the warm-up. And I really don't remember anybody doing that before. Okay, next clip is from episode 56, an uh, interview with Master Hoist Gracie. And Hoist talks about lessons learned from his father, Grandmaster Adio, as well as his mother's influence on him. A very wise individual, your father. Yes. Can you share with us uh, a few lessons, some, some of the things that stand out in your mind? I'm sure there are many things, but a few things that stand mm -hmm. out in your mind that you learned from your father. He was not that kind of person that sits down and talks to you, teaching, telling you. It was more like, uh, follow me, I'll show you how to do it. He was a mm -hmm. show person, you see, instead just tell you how to do it. He was a mm -hmm. big believer and just if you see you doing something, he just gonna step in front of you and say, Let me do it. Watch and learn. Do you have any examples of things that stand out of things that he was any, able to show you? Anything, including the workers at the farm mm. digging a hole. Sometimes the workers have to stand around and watch him do it to learn from him. <laughs> from digging a hole, from building a wall, anything. So he really was the model of what he wanted people to uh, to know or do, not just yep. telling in words. Not just telling. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of coaches out there that will tell people how to do it, but they cannot do it themselves. They never did themselves. Even in BJJ, even in BJJ, there's a lot of guys out there that tell people what the fighters should do and what the fight they, they do telling the fighters, oh, you did this wrong, you should have done this way, but they never fought themselves. If they never mm -hmm. fought, why are they telling people what to do? Well, because I can't fight, and well, just, so shut up, move out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put your money where your mouth is, right? <laughs> yes, and go do it, and then you can talk to people about it. Mm. If you never fought, how are you going to tell John Jones, or how are you going to tell, you see, Verdun or whoever, St. Pierre, how are you going to tell St. Pierre what he did wrong in the fight if you never fought yourself? <laughs> yeah, so See, if so you've never been in that arena, it's it's more theoretical but not actual you know, true experience. He, he has theory, man. Everybody have a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Very true. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, so besides your, your father and your uncle, who I'm sure were both very uh, instrumental and important in your life, uh, who's had the biggest impact on your life, Hoyce? And this can be personally or, or professionally. Oh, man, all my brothers, man, my cousins, man, because I've seen them do it, and I want to do it. I want to be like them. I want to have an opportunity like they had, that, like they had it before me. Mm. What was it like growing up in, in that family with all the brothers and the uh, cousins and the uncles? uh to me, being an insider, it was just another family. We didn't know anything different. <laughs> it's like a kid that grew up in Afghanistan. All they see is war. They think that's normal. For right. us, growing up, growing up, playing fighting and 
You see, in training, that's normal for us. The friends that didn't do it were like, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> so when you're, when you're in the middle of it, it's, it's, I wouldn't say nothing special, but it's just what you know, right? That's all we grow up doing, yeah. So what about your mother, Hoyce? Uh, tell us a little bit about her and what kind of influence she had in your life. She was the mean one. My, oh, father, yeah. would say, my father would say, don't beat your opponents, don't hurt them. Don't punch them. Don't draw any blood. Just subdue them and submission and win the fight. My mother, he walked away. My father, my mother would come in and say, nah, I want to see some blood. You better hurt him. <laughs> <laughs> she was the mean side. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a strong lady. I have to be, so, to be married to Gracie. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. The final clip is from episode 58 my interview with Tom Kalos, and Tom talks about being BJ Penn's first BJJ coach. I uh, had just sold my schools and was living with a friend in Sacramento, deciding what I was going to do next. And I started those classes. I then relocated to Hawaii and, and started uh, training with anybody there who was uh, knew anything about wrestling or jujitsu. And on the big Island where I moved, uh, this was 1993 or four, there was one, only one other guy who had Brazilian jiu-jitsu experience. He was a blue belt. He was a cop on, the, on a real remote part of the Big Island. So he would drive in like an hour and a half to train with me once a week. And I thought he was a master, you know, looking back down. He was, yeah. a, real, he was a neck cranker, right? But uh, right. So I started doing that, and I would visit some judo clubs, and I was wiping people out, even black belts in judo from just the little jiu-jitsu that I knew. And I moved over to Hilo from the Kona side, of the big Island. And the first day I got there, I threw up an ad it to, cause I wanted to train. I knew I had my tests coming up and that I was going to have to do, you know, jujitsu and, and look like I'd been training. And, uh, <laughs> BJ's dad, uh, uh, one of the kids took the ad home from the local gym where I posted it looking for training partners. And he called me that day. And coincidentally, uh, I happened to recognize his voice and I just, I just plugged in my phone and the new place I was living in in Hilo. Well, it turned out BJ's dad was my landlord. Oh, and, really? Uh, so I recognized his voice and I started teaching BJ and Reagan and his other brother, JD, when he was around. And uh, about a year into that, BJ was killing me. I mean, literally killing me. <laughs> and uh, every fight, every day was a fight for survival with among him and his brothers and friends. And I took him, Mr. Reyes was having his 50th birthday party in uh, San Jose. And I, so I went to his dad, uh, BJ's dad, and said, hey, why don't you send him with me and I'll introduce him to somebody who's got a lot better jujitsu than I do. And, you know, uh, we'll see where it goes from there. And that's when I introduced him to health. And that's about a year and a half later, he was winning the, the world championships, the first non-Brazilian ever to win. And nobody even scored a point on it wow. at the tournament. Incredible. So, Incredible. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. And then, in the interim, right after that testing, I had to have my hips replaced, uh, both of them. And I left mm. the Big Island and moved back to my uh, – back to California. I had both my hips replaced, and then I kind of worked on recovery and took jujitsu wherever I was. And uh, it's continued to this day. That was 22 years ago. I'm, I'm a brown belt. I I uh, am not a great brown belt, but, you know, I'm 57. I've, I've had three hip replacements now. <laughs> I'm Jack. Wow. I still show up on the mat and I uh, yeah. I hope to earn my black belt someday and a lot of good people have come and gone on my mats like my my stepson Keenan is and my son Shannon are both black belt sons or Atos and and uh, Shannon earned his black belt under Charles Gracie and I actually started that instructor as well uh, out of Reno uh oh shoot what's his name he's going to kill me now. Uh it'll come to me but he runs Reno BJJ and and became a Gracie affiliate to Charles and uh, he took his first jujitsu lessons with me as well. Nice. Nice. Gary. Um, great. Gary. Great. Is his name. Gary, uh, yeah, Got to get that in there. Wonderful. Yeah. Sorry, Gary. So go back for just a minute. Uh, you just covered a lot of ground, which is very interesting. You, you've obviously had a, a wonderful journey through the arts. When you first started over at house, uh, first of all, it says a lot about Mr. Reyes to, to be so innovative and, and see the value of, you know, cross training and, and getting into other areas of martial arts. So, you know, props to him for sure. Uh, what were your thoughts when you first went over and started dabbling in jujitsu over at house? 
Well, I remember, my, like? I remember my first lesson really well. You know, I'm, I was I was a devoted, the devout martial arts practitioner. And I thought, you know, and I'd studied judo and I'd been around uh, American style jujitsu. And so I, I wasn't a novice. So I joined the class of traditional warm ups like old school did. And then we did drills like every school does now. And then we rolled and I, I rolled primarily with two or three guys. One of them the main guy was uh, that I rolled with was uh, a white belt. He was maybe 10 years, 20 years younger than me. And he pretty much kicked my butt from A to Z. Every submission he knew, every position, I was just, uh, you know, like like I wasn't there. And afterwards, uh, I said, hey, thanks a lot. You know, I was digging it. And he, he said uh, – <laughs> I said, how long have you been studying? He said, about three months. And he said, how long have you been studying? And I said, oh, you know, a while. At that point, it had been like 25 years. <laughs> and uh, like myself, like so many people said, I'm never going to let that happen again. And so I really became committed to jujitsu because I didn't think mm. I should be, uh, as a longtime veteran martial artist and a veteran teacher, that I should be helpless in any situation. You know, it doesn't mean right. I'm going to win in every situation, but to let some guy with three months experience tear me to pieces of course i didn't punch yeah. him or poke his eyes or bite him but i wanted to <laughs> right i'm sure i'm sure <laughs> but, it was a real uh, eye-opener oh but i you know that's the story that's told by so many martial artists who eventually turned to grappling arts realizing there was a huge hole in their game and for years we had debated you know well, what would happen you know there was even a well-publicized matches again men against women and style against style you know that had all these restrictive rules but we really hadn't faced the fact of what would happen until uh, the Gracies came along and really said, well, this is what will happen, you know, and exactly. And we all went, oh, OK, I guess. And the smart ones immediately started training and the ones who were a little thicker, it took them a little while longer. OK, I hope you enjoyed those clips. Uh, it's been an absolute phenomenal year as far as my guests on the show. And I, I consider myself very fortunate to have had the opportunity to interview such great people throughout the year. Uh, I'd like to run through the list of those uh, those people at this time. So started off the year with Todd Tanaka, and then had Chris Saunders, Roy Dean, uh, did the ICP edition, which featured three Pedro Sauer black belts who attended the uh, Gracie Academy's Instructor Certification Program. And these included Alan Manganello, Robbie Singh, and David Christick as well as Ron Wilder and Bill Osterreich from Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Kerry. Next on the show had Eric Silver, Fabio Santos, Mark Moreno, Grandmaster Helson Gracie, Alan Hopkins, Alex Stewart, Little Tony Pazinski, David Porter, Mike Moses, Master Hoist Gracie, Master Pedro Sauer, Tom Kalos, Rob Kahn, then Hiron Gracie was back on the show, and then finally Alan Manganello, full interview, and finished up with Mark Marines. So again, feel very fortunate and grateful that I had the opportunity to uh, speak with and, and um, interview these, these great people. It's been an awesome year as far as this, and I appreciate you being a part of it and being a listener. And I also wanted to thank Howard Steele, Mark Kukro and Jim Bundy for being guest hosts on the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segments. Also, thank you to the Meet the Listener segment guests, which included Art Yamas, Alberto Alvarez, Trey Davis, and Terry Griffin. We currently have had about 122,000 iTunes downloads, and if you've been listening to the show for very long, it's, that's, that number has increased dramatically over the years. We're about two and three quarters years old, the show, and I think about the end of, uh, towards the end of March, it'll be three years. So the amount of uh, growth the show has achieved is just tremendous. The amount of interest that's been shown in the show, I get great feedback, and certainly the number of people that are listening have grown a lot, has grown a lot. So thank you for your support, and I really do appreciate it. I also want to ask that you continue to help me spread the word about the show and um, let your friends and acquaintances know about the show. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment.
Okay, time for our final Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment of the year. So what I'm going to do for this segment is uh, share what I do uh, every New Year's. And uh, um, it's the same process I've shared uh, at least once before on the year recap episode. But uh, I do think it's really worthwhile doing. So again, I want to share it with you. I go through a process every uh, New Year's and I created a little form which I encourage you to do as well. It doesn't have to be just like mine, but um, but some kind of tool to help you kind of recap the year in your own mind. So here's what I do. I have a series of uh, categories slash questions, and I just go through and fill in the information for those for this past year. And here's what that looks like. First category is trips. What trips have I taken this year? You know, if you take a lot of trips, you may not remember some of the ones towards the uh, early part of the year. And going back and just focusing on it helps you kind of relive those trips. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, business trips, could be personal, whatever. But it helps you kind of remember what all, the, what all the trips you've done and what that was like during the year. Second category is peak experiences. What peak experiences have I had this year? And this really helps, you know, go back and record and relive those peak experiences. You know, it's really cool to go back within any of these categories, to go back, you know, last year or even, you know, five years ago and look at what that year was like, what trips you took that year, what peak experiences you took or you had in that year. And it's a great way to record and relive those moments in in that year. So peak experiences, you know, what made the year special? What made it worth living for you? Next category is challenges. What challenges did you experience within this year? And how did you overcome those? It also helps to go back, you know, again, through previous years and look at what challenges you had in those years and to realize, you know, you did make it through quite a bit and to acknowledge how you did it. So it always helps strengthen us and strengthen our resolve. And the next category is what do you want more of in the coming year? So in this case, what, what do I want more of in 2017? And what am I committed to manifesting more of? You know, I'm a firm believer in giving the mind a clear and positive direction to move towards. I think the more we clearly define our goals or clearly get that mental image in our mind and give it to our mind where we want to go and what we want more of, we have a lot more of a chance of experiencing more of that in our life and moving in that direction. Of course, we can't control everything that happens in every part of our life, but giving ourselves and giving our mind that clear direction certainly helps move us in that direction helps set the course in action and that's a much better experience than just kind of drifting along hoping you have a good year so what are you committed to for this next year i encourage you to do this exercise or one similar and record and relive your past year and go ahead and set the stage for this coming year what do you want more out of what do you want to accomplish in this year and go ahead and prepare yourself and your mind for that I hope that this has been a a really great year for you, and I hope this coming year will be the best one ever for you. Again, thank you so much for being a part of the show and being a listener. I really do appreciate it. It makes me feel so great to to be able to connect with so many people. And uh, again, always if you have feedback for the show or suggestions, certainly don't hesitate to give those. So thanks very much, and Happy New Year. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate all feedback, so if you have feedback, please don't hesitate to give it. If you have ideas for the show or for guests, please let me know about those. You can leave feedback on the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. You can also leave feedback on iTunes, and while you're there, make sure to rate the show. It helps us with our standing in iTunes. If you haven't liked us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, please go ahead and do that. And don't forget to share the episodes on your Facebook and social media. Again, thanks again for listening. And until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.